Revelation chapter 1. There is some things that's sweeter than honey. And it's good that we could assemble and get in on some of this. Crazy thing to the world, but sure it's a joyful thing to those that know Him. How would you like to be a street person in heaven? You wouldn't have to reach out for something. Just reach down and pick it up. <laughs> well, here we are pilgrims and strangers. As strangers, we are far from home. As pilgrims, thank God we are on the way home. And it's not going to be as long as it has been. And... I, I dream about it at times. I have a lot of folks over there I, I'd like to see again. I'm getting kind of lonely. I'm kind of antiquated and old-fashioned and out of date here. <laughs> but there's one place, praise God. Uh, I've got a residency there. Up there, we don't have to have undertakers or policemen or exterminators or politicians, thank God, and no zoning committee. <laughs> Amen. Some things not up there. You won't find a graveyard up there. You won't find no widows, no orphanage. Just think, just just a meal up there. Man, what a banquet. Well, I'm not going to preach on that, but here in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, our text. But I'd just like to say, thank God for you. We always recognize the preachers. <laughs> I first started preaching, it scared me to death to see all them preachers out there. But now it's just like preaching to a bunch of convicts that's out on parole, and it, it, it don't bother me like it did. And it's my joy to see just the average person saved by grace of God. Amen. We're all on equal ground. And, us preachers, God give us a good office, but otherwise we're not so hot. <laughs> Amen. Revelation 1 and 5, if you found it, say amen. If you hadn't found it, say wait. And if you didn't bring your Bible, say shame on me. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. I want to speak to you tonight on the blood of Jesus. Jesus shed his blood six times. I don't know of anything any greater than the blood of the Lamb of God. Now, I know it would bring on the hatred, the malice, the disrespect of this old world, but I thank God for the blood. And if you're here tonight, you're saved, you had a washing of regeneration that was in the blood of the Son of God. The washing of water, you don't get that until later on. That comes after you're saved and belong to the church. I'm grateful for the church. 
And I know that everybody that's in a church is not in the church. But I love the church, and also I love local church. And as long as we have this physical body like this and say we ought to also be a member of a local New Testament gospel preaching church. And I read this book, I find that the church is a blood-stained church. If you could see a picture of ourselves tonight in the blood stream of God, we'd look like a bunch of red corpuscles in that blood stream. One time man didn't have blood before Adam sinned, but when he sinned, something happened to his water system, and his water was turned to blood. One time, man had his shining and his brightness, and he wasn't ashamed that he didn't have clothes on. He or his wife, because they had that glory and that brightness. God had made him out of the dust of the earth, and He'd made him out of gold's dust, if you please. But man, when he sinned, he squandered the silver and gold, and he wound up with fool's gold. And the thing that's wrong with you physically, a lot of you here tonight, is that in your blood system, the fool's gold... <laughs> has turned to rust. Now, I used to do some prospecting, and I know about all Carolina, and he got rust. And Adam left us bankrupt, and, and brother, after they have all of these tanning salons. Everybody that's real white is wanting to get gold. It's on the dark side of life is wanting to get lighter. We have a blood-stained Bible here. If you prick it almost anywhere and you can see the bloodstream of Emmanuel, God with us, flowing through this book. And without that blood, this book wouldn't be worth one iota. I lost everything I had because of this book. I lost my home, my business, my church, my health, my family because of this book. But of all the possessions that I could ever own, I'd rather own this one book than to own the millions of dollars that wealthy men may have. I'd rather own this one book than on thousands of acres of land. I'd rather have this one book, thank God, than have prestige, than to have the news media to puff me and to, to fault me. I'd rather have this. And it's a bloody old book. But thank God the blood washes whiter than snow. I'm going to a heaven, and heaven has been washed with the blood. For God, who the heavens and earth cannot contain, who clothes himself with the universe, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. And when on that cross, Jesus Christ was shed in his blood, way up kind on the mercy seat, for God set in the universe when Jesus bleeding all over. And God Almighty, His blood sprinkled all over the heavens and the earth and the universe. And when Jesus died, God reached over and got that old veil from the top and tore it down, thank God, to the bottom. We walk in a bloody path. Last time I saw the sun go down at the ocean, you could look at it was 
hanging on the horizon just like a, a big purple blot of blood. And if you've ever seen where thousands of sheep have gone across a pasture and tried to grass down with their little feet, that's the way it looked across the water, like there was a path where thousands of feet had gone through that thing towards the sun. But as the sun was shining, there was a red path and a bloody path, and, and I couldn't believe it. And so I got about 12 feet over here on this side, and thank God it's still between me and the sun. And so I walked over on this side, and lo and behold, the path was still there. And if you're saved, you're walking, thank God, a bloody path, but it's the blood of the Son of God. Up yonder's a blood-stained throne. I have to go every day. I love to go. Usually I'm by myself. I'm coming in about every day or every night from down in the boondocks or from some swamp or across the mountains or from some town or from some city. And usually it's just me and Jesus. And I got to where I kind of like it. Because I can talk to him and no one will interrupt me. And I can laugh and cry and shout and bless the name of God. And I can even go to Jesus and tell him about my sins and my wrongs. And thank God he won't even tell an angel. But you just try that on some Baptist. Our songs are blood-stained songs. And if you leave out the blood, you don't have any song. I get tired of all these songs about old backslider songs about me, me, I, I, me, me, I, I. But boy, I sure do love to hear them when they begin to sing about him. Something about the blood. You know, Jesus, they paid 30 pieces of silver for him, to betray him. That's the price of a female slave. And the reason they bought him with the price of a female slave was because he was buying a woman, thank God. And I'm glad that I'm part of that woman that he bought that's called the church, the body of Jesus Christ. I get weary of these folks that can look at the church and they can take it or they can leave it. It don't bother them too much. If they miss the service, they'll alibi and lie and do other things. But, and it, it kind of disturbs me. Because this thing of a church, it's not something that some man thought up. It's not what religious people get together and we just say religious things and do religious things. But brother, Jesus Christ bought a woman. In that genetic makeup of the blood of a man and a woman... It's amazing because, you see, when you got washed in the blood of Jesus, if you're saved, you bear His genes, you have His chromosomes, you have His genetic makeup, and the genetic code in that DNA for a man and a woman, if it's a man, it's XY. And if it's a woman, it's X, X. Well, that's double cross. And don't you women feel like sometimes you just got double crossed? Well, the devil sure did do it to you. Because a woman was deceived. And that's the reason when a mother has a child... If it's a boy, she goes one week for purification, eighth day he's circumcised, then she goes 33 days to complete her purification. 
this thing between genders. It's not a matter of equality. It's a matter of having a different role given to us by God. And that leaves out the perverts. You know, one of the sodomites out in California died. And he's cremated. And he sent his ashes home in a fruit jar. And a man is XY, a woman is XX, but if a baby is born and does not have that cross, that X in his genetic makeup, in three days the baby will die. Three years ago, my daughter had a child. She was nursing it just about three days, and he died. They put him on all this apparatus and kept his body alive for two months and took him off. And I sat with her there for about three days and nights, and she'd hold him and I'd hold him. We'd pray together and we'd sing together and we'd cry together. But right at the end of the third day, just like a whisper, gone. And if you've never been to the cross and get that cross where the Son of God bore your sins and shed His blood for you, you're going to die. And it's going to be an eternal death. Now, six times Jesus shed blood. He shed his blood the first time when he was eight days old. Eight means something new. There's seven days. The eighth day is a new day, a new week. There's eight notes on a piano, seven notes. The eighth note is a higher octave. It's a new beginning. And when a boy is eight days old or something about his blood, just makes it right then for him to be circumcised. And on the eighth day, Jesus was circumcised. God talks about a thousand years as a day, and a day is a thousand years. And we know that this book teaches that formula that when the sixth day is gone, the seventh thousand years is a millennial reign. It's a period of rest. But then on the eighth day, God circumcises the heavens and earth, and He tears them and He folds them up, and there's a new heaven and a new earth. And Jesus shed His blood that you might have a new beginning. And if any man be in Jesus Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, and the whole, all things become new. And you can just put it down, something's wrong when a person's supposed to be saved, and nothing has become new. I read of Hannah over there, and Hannah couldn't have children, and... Her husband had two wives. The one wife could have children, and she couldn't. And he's always flaunting at her and making fun of her. <laughs> I can, and you can't. And there's nothing any more worse than two women at each other. And she haunted her and tormented her and aggravated her to no end. And Hannah had cried and cried and cried. And her husband... Though he loved her most, he couldn't even sympathize with her because she wanted a child and she couldn't have a child. And the reason she couldn't have a child, she didn't have life inside of her. All she had was death. And what she needed was the grace of God. And when she found the grace of God, and the old priest said, 
when she was praying down there, said, Lord, bless you. Grant your prayer unto you. And when she got life on the inside, something new took place. It wasn't long because she began to walk different. <laughs> what long she began to look different. It may have been protruded out here, but she even looked different. And you didn't have to talk to her about modest dress because when that child coming on, she had life in her, she began to even dress different. And when you get men and women saved by the grace of God and washed in the blood, they'll walk different, they'll smell different, they'll do different, they'll act different, they'll walk different. God saves an old sock, he won't be down there at the old hog pen drinking that old slop again. Amen. And Jesus shed his blood that man may have a new beginning, thank God. I remember that night I got saved and went home. I couldn't believe it. It's like all creation had been washed and cleansed. I was afraid to go to bed. I was afraid it wouldn't be there in the morning. But when I got up in the morning, thank God, it was just as sweet and clean and pure and undefiled. Hallelujah. Then Jesus shed his blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. His salvation for soul agony. He said, The prince of this world cometh and findeth nothing in me. And his disciples, he left them, you know, and told the last bunch, said, You watch and pray with me. And he went a stone throw farther, and he fell headlong, exceedingly sore, his soul, nigh to death, and sweating great drops and gouts of blood out of every pore of his skin. And there Jesus shed his blood for soul agony. I've seen some human beings get in some terrible things in life. But I've never saw anything what I would term worse than when I saw somebody that I just knew they had soul agony. To see somebody that knew they were going to hell and were going to be there in a little bit and there's nothing they could do about it. But Jesus shed his blood. Thank God that I've never had to lay in some dark corner of hell and weep unnoticed by mercy forever. A lot of folks make fun. They talk about that every day of their life. They tell somebody, well, you go jump in the lake. You go jump in the lake. Well, for a lost soul, there's coming a time when you can turn Jesus down and God and say, you go jump in the lake. And then Jesus shed his blood when they put that crown of thorns upon him. Mm. Don't you know that hurt? I remember a boy used to go barefooted. You had to because you only got one pair of shoes a year. <laughs> and some of you got so many, you, you can't even wear them all in one year. For two years, I rammed an old locust thorn up my foot, and that thing will stay there, and man, it'll build over, and then it'll puss up, and it'll run, and you'll hobble around, and you're talking about sore. They didn't, they didn't have to insult him. They could have used straw, but no, they got to hurt Jesus. You can always tell the way the devil is. He's always dirty. The world treats Jesus dirty. Jesus Christ came down condescended, and of all things, He came down like a man. 
Well, sometimes I get around human beings. I want to get off somewhere, just go take a shower, get on top of the mountain and let the wind blow through my hair and forget human beings because there's nothing I have ever saw any worse than a bunch of whining and crying and sick and moaning type of human beings. It's better to have an old dog and go home and scratch him between his ears and he'll wag his tail. But you get to some human being and you say, How are you today, brother? And you would to God you'd never ask him. How would you like to be a medical doctor? And every work day, the door's open. In comes somebody. Don't nobody ever come in jolly and happy. Everybody coming in, they're down, they're walking on their lip, they're dragging the ground. How'd you like to be a dentist? Look what he puts up with. Nobody ever runs in there and holler, Glory to God! Look at that, got an old abscess. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> but Jesus came down to where we are. Boy, human beings can make a mess of things. Man, how low he came down. He came down lower than the angels, came down to men. Like that little old woman, Syrophoenician woman, calling Jesus, thou son of David, Jesus, thou son of David, and he wouldn't listen. And Cyprus said, Lord, she's calling after us. Well, she wasn't even noticing them. She's wanting Jesus. And, and she's calling the wrong way, and finally he stopped and wanted to find out what she's wanting. He told her, said, Look, said, I, I, I take the bread of the children and give to dogs. And she said, but Lord, the dogs eat the crumbs that falls from the table. You know, Jesus came down. Jesus made himself a dog for us Gentiles. He wasn't literally a dog, but as a dog. That's the way some folks treat Jesus. You know, an old dog come by, and if you feel pretty good, you throw him a little bit out there. Throw him a piece of bread. Throw him something. That's the way folks treat Jesus sometimes. If they feel kind of religious like and pious that time, they'll throw Jesus just a little bit. And you know at home you get mad at your wife and you go out and slam the door and old hound laying there and you haul off and you kick the old hound. You take it out on him. And that's the way a lot of folks, they get mad in church and, and mad about the things of God. They take it out on Jesus and kick Jesus and kick Jesus and kick Jesus. Mm. Jesus went so low, he said, I'm a worm. <laughs> well, that's getting pretty low because, you know, that's what you were before you was born in your father's loans. That sperm motto, that sperm that formed you was a little bitty worm. And if you die without God in the resurrection, you're going to lose your soul and revert to a worm, to a red maggot. You know, crown of thorns. He didn't give us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Boy, we're living in a day when all the pressure that's upon people, you better have the mind of Christ our brother was talking about. And Jesus shed his blood that you can have the right mind about this thing. Thank God. And I won't hit these and go along, but Jesus shed blood when he was scourged. They took him down there where I put it over that old beaten post at Gabbatha. Had that old cat of nine tails and glass and iron and tin and claws and hooks in it and thirteen times over that shoulder. Thirteen times over that shoulder. Thirteen times around the middle and hook him and pull it and lacerate him and tear him and cut him and his intestines leak out and he can see his bones and his organs and, and gory mess there and blood everywhere. And here is salvation from chastisement. 
The Bible talks about some disobedient people are going to be beat with many stripes. But he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And I'm glad that when I do wrong, I can get it right. Because Jesus shed His blood and He was beat for me. And I can run to Him and I can find a hiding place. I remember when just a boy, one particular time, my younger brother out on the farm, you didn't have much to play with. with but we'd take old plow points and make use them for horseshoes. And... One day he got angry with me, and he took my homemade horseshoes and threw them in the toilet. That little brown building. And I know I, I socked him real good. And blood ran out of his nose. Mama! Oh, Lord. You won't do anything but get mother at you. And I ran and spent all long afternoon dying of thirst, wishing I'd never been born, uh, hoping that something would happen some way that I know couldn't happen, and wait till Daddy come home from work. And when he came home, I tried to follow him in, but she got me. But I tell you one thing, we got a lot of God's people, and they've been flogged, and God has beaten the daylights out of them, and and whipping them, and they don't have any joy in their salvation. They're not enjoying the things of God. They don't have any liberty in prayer. They don't get prayers answered, and, and they're more miserable than an old sinner out there in the gutter. And, and, but Jesus shed His blood that, that you can come and confess them things and get them under the blood and get them right. And He took our beating. And then Jesus shed his blood when they nailed his hands and feet to that tree. Right through there. Put on the other and right through there. You see, here's salvation for your walk and your work. You know, some of you have to walk in places where others don't have to walk. Some of you are going through some things that the pastor don't know anything about. Some of you are facing things that even your sweetheart and your darling companion may not know anything about. But Jesus has shed His blood that no matter how trying, thank God you can walk. And you can walk worthy of Him, and you can walk circumspectively. And some of you, the work you do is not work like someone else. A lot of folks got the idea that if I can't be a preacher, of course, you used to even do anything. Why, that preaching's not so hot when you get down to it. I know I've been at it 48 years, and I can't preach any better now. It seems like than when I start. I was pastor 23 years. Last church I had started out with 12 people, looked like the 12 original colonies. And we met in an old house and holes you could throw tomcats through the wall. Preached and God blessed and God blessed the last time I was there we had eight hundred and eighty eight. But I seen the time that Sunday night I said, I, I think I'll quit. The devil come along and <laughs> man you'd work and you'd pray and you'd try. Win folks to God and help folks out of trouble and 
get them in church, want to build your church and make it look like Jesus was visiting down there and God was alive, you know, and you didn't want to look like just a little handful down there and the barber shops was full and the ballpark was full and the skating rinks was full and Saturday night down there to VFW, you know, that's very fast women. They doing the skunk drive and the buzzard flop and shaking her sacrilegiac and doing the bow evil weagle down there and, and the high step and the Russian poker and all that thing. And they're full down there, put down at the God's house, just a few people and everybody is down at the mouth and down in the heart and everybody's defeated and, and there's no victory and there's no triumph and it looks like nobody cares and how many times I said, I quit. And he wouldn't let me. You know why? He said his blood that old brother Walter might be able to work for Jesus Christ and thank God my work and my labor is not in vain. And whatever you give, whether it's cleaning the bathroom and the commode or sweeping the floor or shaking hands or praying for the preacher or giving out tracts, thank God He shed His blood that you might do it for the glory of God and get a reward. All these girls get here and sing, and every time I'm around them, I'm always enthused and amazed at them because I think one time, thank God, us preachers just have to sit back and stand back and let them get the accolades and the plaudits and the blessing and get what's due unto them. I know it's not easy for them, and I know there's times when they shed some tears and they're bitter. And their heart, hot, and their heart is crushed. But thank God Jesus shed His blood that no matter how feeble and insignificant what I do for Him might seem to be, thank God I can get a reward, hallelujah, that'll make the Clinton administration look like nothing. And then Jesus shed his blood when that soldier took that spear right up under there, that short rib. You know, that's where God took that rib out and made woman. And Adam woke up and looked at her and said, Whoa, man. And she woke up and looked at him and said, Hey, man. And right under there, the blood and water ran out. It pierced on up into his heart. And Jesus shed his blood there for the church. Now, I love the church. I remember 1952 on a sunny Sunday morning. I was to go to church and pick up mother. And that night before I'd been out, whoo, man, I smelt like a skunk. And a skunk's a polecat, and the polecat's a two-tone streamlined kitty with fluid drive. <laughs> man, I had a headache. I drank old sour mash and hit it sour the second time, and you could smell, I smelled the high Helens, and Man, I was sick, and the sun wasn't helping. I didn't want to go, and I had to go and sit there. And here I was, my 40 Ford white side walls and twin Hollywood muffler, and that thing just chickalacker, you know, but I wasn't enjoying the chickalacker. And I pulled up beside that little building. Oh, you could have, it wasn't about half the size of this room. Cinder block building. I sat there looking at that thing, and I thought, whoever... I come up with that. Why, he was drinking something worse than I'd got a hold of. And I was sitting there, and man, I listened to them, and they wasn't singing my music. You couldn't do the soft shoe, you know, and, and you couldn't get up there and, and get real close, you know. You know, that old blue moon of Kentucky or Tennessee, boy, it's caused more sin and send more souls to hell than any one song I know of. Where to get real close to somebody else's wife, you know.
So that's what they do down there at the BFW, you know. They go and dance a while, then go out with somebody else's wife and drink a little, love a little bit, you know, and come back and do it again and, and dance as fast as you can, act like you're having a good time, you're out of breath, you're about to die, you're sick, won't regurgitate, and, and everybody just grinning. Ain't we having a good time, though? And I thought that preacher ain't that something. Here he is just laying them people out, raising his voice, then taking up an offering from them. <laughs> I thought, ain't that something? They talk to somebody you can't see, and they'll cry, and they'll, they'll laugh, you know, and somebody shout. I thought, man, that's, that's weird. And I thought, man, I'll be glad when it's over. I need a little hair of the dog that bit me. I'm sick. Come on, service. Get over it. And finally it was over, and here I saw my soul mother out there talking to another lady. And I thought, Mama, not today. Come on! I, if you just knew how sick I was, and I was sitting there wishing and wishing. You know, it's like Baptists. You know, sitting and wishing won't change your faith. The Lord change, provides the fishing. You've got to provide the bait. And so I was sitting there and wishing Mama would come on, and all of a sudden out came a beautiful brunette, graceful. And I kind of sat up, and... I thought, well, maybe I might live, you know, or something. That, and, and, and beautiful. And here she came out there. And, and she was. She was gorgeous, vivacious, and breathtaking. And my heart, I could feel it. It, I, it was beating. And, and it looked like she was coming to the car. And sure enough, here she was coming to the, my Ford. And that window, you know, and... You know, and... <laughs> And she came and invited me to church. And I, old carnal, dirty, lost, black-hearted me, I thought, man, I can do that. My lucky day. <laughs> Boy, she don't know what she's getting into. Hot dog. I just looked up today. Well, mother finally came on. We got home, and I took about three or four baths. I mean, and I washed with Clorox, and I brushed my teeth till my gums bleeding, and stole all the cologne after shave my brother had, and man, I spent all afternoon putting that little pompadour up there, getting that thing just right, and I found an old seedy suit, and I put that thing on, and looked something like. Between Frank Not Sahatra and Ernest T. Bass. <laughs> and I came to church. They got me over here on the third pew. And I, I didn't think much of it. I, I thought, well, man, I can sing too, and I'll just be pious and sing and, and, and put up with it. And after a while, the service will be over, and hot dog, hot dog, it's my time. Boy, she, she don't know what she's getting into. Well, we sang and we sang and then sat down. The preacher began to preach, and I began to get nervous and fidgety, and I gripped till the blood vessels looked like they are going to burst on my hand. Nearly wore the seat of them old seedy britches out there. And it came to me that someone had told that preacher every low-down, dirty thing I'd ever done. And, and, and I got angry and I got mad. And, and, but then I got scared. And I knew if I left, I was going to go to hell and bust hell wide open if I left there. And I got in terrible fix. And I didn't know what to do. And that preacher preached. And man, he's like a 70 millimeter tank gun. He's hitting me broadside every time. And he'd run, oh, wham, yow. And, and oh, oh, wham, yow. And, and he just tearing me up. And I was going to hell. And I knew it. And they began to sing an invitation song. First stanza, verse went by. And then it started on the second. Man, I was scared. Man, what am I going to do? Man, I'm going to hell if I leave here. And I don't know what to do. Well, how do you get... I don't know. The preacher came by and put his hands on me. Said, Son, don't you want to be... Saved? Yes, sir. Man, it wasn't no arguing. Now, I mean, it wasn't easy to believe this and believe me. So I, I was already suffering torments. And, and man, I, I came down and 
got on this side and got on my knees. No one opened the Bible. No one to pray with me. And I was squirming there. My Father who art in heaven, but God wasn't my Father. And finally, out of my ignorance, from the bottom of my heart, oh God, oh God, save me. I can't save myself. Keep me. I can't keep myself. Leave me. I don't know which way to go. Until I save you and I keep you and I'll be with you living it. Take care of your dying. And it comes time to make a cross and I'll be there waiting for me. And I got saved. I mean, I didn't get religion. I didn't get something to keep. I got somebody to keep me. Well, I don't know what happened to that girl that night, but I know someone gave me a New Testament. And I know I went home and everybody in the bed, I was in the kitchen, that old blue baby cook stove, little fire, and had the oven open. And I got down on my knees and began to read the Word of God. Man, and, and it's something so sweet, so joyful I couldn't explain it. And the best part, no condemnation. My heart wouldn't accuse me. I wasn't afraid it's going to die and go to hell. Man, there's a peace. There's serenity. There's a springtime. There's a cleanness. And I've never felt like that in all of my days since I got to the age of accountability. And when I got up the next morning, it was still there. I got saved at church. I got called to preach at church. I got ordained at church. I learned how to sing the hymns at church. I followed the Lord believers' baptism down at the church. I made friends, good friends, lasting friends. True friends, two blue friends, down at the church. And I did some courting down at the church. Thank God I've been blessed by the church. You know why? Jesus shed His blood for the church. It's the greatest place in this community. You know where it is? Here at Victory Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. You know what's going on here tonight? It's more important than anything that will go on this month in the courthouse, this month in the schoolhouse, this month down there at the Capitol House, uh, this month this year at Washington, D.C. The greatest thing in the world is happening here. Amen. 